So just so everyone knows, we are recording and this will be available on our YouTube channel. So I will start as usual with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge the Leni Lenape as the original people of this land and their continuing relationship with their territory. For over 10,000 years, they have been the caretakers of these lands and the Delaware River. Leni Lenape means original people. Over a period of 250 years, many Lenape people were removed and dispersed throughout the country. Some took refuge with other tribes. A large number of Lenape families remain in the homelands and continue the traditions of their ancestors up to our present day. This land acknowledgement in itself is a small gesture. We hope this, off this offer of a small action um, opens a greater public consciousness of Native sovereignty and cultural rights. I encourage you to learn more about the Leni Lenape people of today and their history. We are so excited to have Carly Slade with us today. Um, Carly is one of my favorite people. She was in Philadelphia <laughs> <laughs> for a few years um, and we've lost her to other parts of the country for a bit. <laughs> she was just turning her light back on, good job. <laughs> um, Carly Slade grew up in Big Sky, Alberta, Canada. She, she earned her MFA from San Jose State University and her BFA from the Alberta College of Art and Design. Her work is influenced by her blue collar roots and plagued by a concern for the precarious nature of the working class. Using a mix of materials, most often clay embroidery and building supplies, Slade creates dioramas of real places in an unreal perspective. Carly has had numerous solo exhibitions, including one at Greenwich House in New York City. She was a resident artist at the Tyler School of Art and visiting assistant professor at Arizona State University, Southern Illinois University. She's currently assistant professor at the University of Wyoming, which is why she's waiting for her furniture to arrive. Um, she has another major solo show coming up in St. Louis at the Sheldon and also one at the University of Wyoming Art Museum. Welcome, Carly. Thank you, thanks for having me. Um, so the reason we're having Carly, besides that she's amazing, is that she has an exhibition at the Clay Studio right now, and it is a fabulous sculptural model of the current Clay Studio building at 137 slash 139 North 2nd Street. So if you're in the area, please do come and see it. It's worth spending time with. Uh, we'll look at some photos a little bit later on, but. Um, it's really wonderful in person. So we're just gonna dive in like we usually do and ask the big question, how and why did you make the brave decision to make your life in art? Wow. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, you told me that question yesterday and I've been thinking about it and it was like a, it's like a series of moments more so than um, one, I think. And for me, especially finding clay was kind of like a fluke in a way. I went to art school uh, to be a painter, like I think most people do, although I lied to my parents and told them I was going to be a designer because then I'd have a job. Oh, a lot of people uh, do that too, I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I took a ceramics class, just kind of like, oh, I wonder what goes on down there. Um, and within a week or two, just felt like head over heels, endlessly in love. Um, I think that I decided fairly young that I wanted to be an artist. I think when I decided to go to art school, I made that decision. And then I always had this belief that like, somebody's got to make it, so why not me? That's like what I would always say to all of, you know, the people that are like, what are you going to do with your art degree? Or what are you going to do when you grow up? And it's like, somebody's got to make it, so why can't I? You know, everybody, there's, somebody gets to be... Um, I was gonna say Britney Spears, but hashtag free Britney Spears. That's a whole thing. Somebody gets to be the celebrities, the actresses, the artists. So like, why can't that be me? And just kind of like devoted to putting in the work that was needed to get there. Um, I think that a lot of artists, a lot of makers just have this innate drive inside of them to make and there's no kind of resisting that and there's kind of no other option. And it just is what it is. So I feel like in a lot of ways, I was kind of like given no choice and then had to go about figuring out how to make it work. Yeah. What What do you remember when you were a kid about, like, you said you were, you wanted to be an artist. Why? Like, 
what was it that you were? Oh, doing? I don't think I realized that until high school. <laughs> and that's because I took art class because I knew I could skip it to go snowboarding. <laughs> that's what you do in Canada. Real answer, real answer. Yeah. <laughs> and then I was like, hold on, I love this. Uh, I think as a kid, you know, my parents always put me in lots of different like craft classes and art classes, and I always really loved it. My mom is a pretty epic embroiderer, and now she's taken up basket weaving, so there was always lots of like arts and crafts and things going on. Uh, my dad is an electrician, and he did a lot of like renovating the house and building things, so there was always this like high value for like the handmade trips to museums and those types of things, so I think as a kid, I always like intrinsically knew that it was something that had a lot of value and something that I was drawn towards and something that was like honorable, um, which is definitely something I still see a lot of in my work. I love that word applied to the making art. Yeah. It's what got a U in it though. Hmm? It's got a U in it. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm writing it with a U. Thank you. Thank you. It's got a U. We like to talk a lot about how Carly is from another country. Yes. <laughs> um, maybe that's how Diana would spell it also. I don't know. Honorable with a U. Um, maybe. Okay. <laughs> She's also from a, another country. Um, so what about the high school art class? Why, why did you say, oh my gosh, I love this so much? Was it because of the teacher? Was it because you got, nope, not the teacher. Okay. <laughs> she told me I wouldn't get into art school. Oh, no. And then she was like, see Carrie over here who was painting like giant flower paintings. She was like, Carrie, she'd probably get in. And I was like, Ugh. like as an educator now and being a teacher is something I've known I've wanted to do since I was like a really little girl. So it's nice that they've come together. But being a teacher and looking back at that, I'm like, girl, like, why would you do that? Um, I think a lot of people in the beginning get into art because there's something that they want to communicate and they're not capable of doing it in words. I think you see that a lot with young artists that start making stuff that's like really emotional and dark and it's like the emo phase and everybody kind of has it in the beginning. And I think that's why I was drawn to art as this like way to communicate and express. Um, and then as time went on, you get kind of more sophisticated, you get through those terrible teenage years and you start to kind of like move on and make more, yeah, mature work, I would say. More um, subtle, maybe. Yeah, well, you instead, yeah, you come, different issues. I, when I was in high school, I wasn't making work about the working class, yeah. Well, but then you had your own, so your, your path wasn't straight, like undergrad, grad, art teacher. You had some other important life experience yeah yeah I always knew that I was going to go to grad school but I wanted to take some time off to kind of like experience the real world leave academia uh, grow up a bit um, starting in undergrad I was working construction in the summers so Canadian summers are four months long <laughs> the the break is although arguably the actual summer is as well but the academic break is four months long so I would work on gas lines um, six days a week, 10 hours a day to like make money for next year's school. And then I graduated with my BFA and then I started working. Um, I was co-owner and shop manager of a precast GFRC concrete shop. So like concrete, super refined concrete, like concrete countertops and sinks and furniture and wall paneling and stuff like that. So I did that starting in my last year of undergrad and then kind of like full-time for three years and then you know somewhere in year two I just kind of felt inside of me that um it was time to go to grad school so I applied and, and went off and sold my part of the company um off to help pay for grad school yeah well and I think that's really important you know I was I was looking at your bio I just I feel like there's there's so much value in the fact that you were it was still a skill. Like it was still a craft. You were making things. Um, well, concrete in, almost seemed like fast clay. Like it would like set up overnight. And the way that we worked with it, it's not, it's not at all traditional concrete like you would see in a driveway. Like it was, it's like cement and really fine sand and you put it in your hands and like build with it and shape with it. So yeah, it kind of felt like fast clay. A lot of the same like, um, mold principles that I learned in clay class. And I learned a lot of 
skills there that I now like transfer over into ceramics. And do you think that that's kind of where you, this focus on blue collar working class and just, I don't know, the buildings that you're interested, is that, do you think that was formed when you were in, in that field or? No, I think, I mean, in undergrad, I was making work about that too. Uh, my dad is an electrician. Alberta is very like blue collar, um, Edmonton especially, it's like the oil province. So um, growing up, all my friends, their dads were like pipe fitters or welders or this type of thing. Um, so that's always just been kind of part of who I am and a lot of the like culture, which is interesting now moving here to Wyoming, which is also an oil state and uh, interact again with that kind of like macho getter done kind of culture is interesting but um I think I've always just been pretty in tune with that especially as a kid uh like when the oil markets would crash and seeing like the stress on my parents face the stress on my friends like people losing houses people losing trucks all of these things it was just like always very tied to who I was and then as a girl I was a total daddy's girl and followed her around and wanted to help him with everything wanted to know how stuff was made and collecting little bits of screws and washers and things that looked cool. Like it was kind of inevitable and in undergrad, I made a lot of work using um, like pipes and hammers, a bit more kind of uh, on the nose. Um, well, I wanna, I wanna both show people images of your work because it's so, um, you know, connected to what you're saying. And I also wanna sort of keep talking about the fact that when you came to Philadelphia, you were, you know, and we connected on architecture and you got so excited about learning about the architecture of Philadelphia, which was exciting to me. Um, and we had some really great walking times around Philly. Um, I guess I want, where am I going with this? I want, I want you to talk about like why you love architecture, why you love buildings. And then really it's old buildings and it's buildings that show the, um, the marker of having, you know, existed through various time periods and, and different um, owners and a lot of dilapidated buildings. Um, so I also am kind of desperate to ask you if I can't remember, did you ever go visit the Mercer Museum? Is that that old crazy house? Well, yeah, the Font Hill and Mercer and the tile works, but they're made out of concrete and I don't think I ever like connected that enough to bring you up there and it's like three giant buildings made of concrete and I totally should have taken you there sorry well and like the residents went there not long ago and I saw that on Instagram and was like man I yeah I'm kicking myself for not doing that yeah that being said post pandemic I would love to come hang out in Philly again and if you want to take me on a guided tour of the Mercer Museum I will definitely do that. Oh, that's so exciting. Um, so why do I love buildings? I mean, I think because uh, working construction, I've been on crews that are building houses and been in that culture. And I think it's endlessly amazing that a bunch of us like little human ants clear this place, this like chunk of land, cut down trees and like build this house, all these trades work together. Um, you know, thinking about the people as somebody who's hung out on sites and made friends and, you know, you're having a coffee break, a smoke break, and you're chatting about life and you learn about somebody's kids and mom and pop companies. And like, I think about all of the people and lives that went into the building of the building. And then once it exists as a building, it's like, you know, it's like this vessel that contains a little bit of all those people that have been through it. It's also, I think of it almost like a book with blank pages and it's like we like mark things as we move through them whether it's like something as simple as like hammering a nail in the wall to hang your family portrait um you know backing out of your driveway one day and like nicking the wall or something like there's like all these like little remnants that that talk about this and it's almost I almost feel like an archaeologist like looking at these buildings and trying to like piece their history or who's been there. I'm just like endlessly interested in like the everyday stories. And then I also think um, this one here with the burnt out bay, that's a building from Philly. And using Google maps, I can travel backward in time and see it. 
um, I think it's up to like 10 years at this point. It depends where it is. But this we building- can, You can click the thing to make it go back. Oh yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. and like sometimes I'll, <laughs> sorry, I get really excited. Um, sometimes I will intentionally like make a building based off of it like four or five years ago, depending on what narrative I'm trying to talk about. Uh, but this was it at that time since another photo has been taken of it. So it's gotten a bit worse, but I was able to go back in time and you can see the building, you know, kind of not healing itself, but being in better and better condition. And in the last one, you can even see people like sitting on the front porch, hanging out. Yeah. And it's like so interesting to be able to see that history. It's really endlessly interesting to me that that history is captured in a Google cloud somewhere. And then I have also gone and made this like ceramic replica of it that could arguably last 10,000 years. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's just kind of endlessly fruitful. I'm interested in like history and politics and people and all of these things. And a building is, it's just, it's all there. It's all in there. That's actually, so I've, I've talked about this before. So sorry for people hearing this again, but if you look at my wall, um, that, that's not wallpaper. It's actually the glue that was used to attach the fake wood paneling that was here when I bought the house. So somebody was applying the glue on the wall and I'm, I, I can't bring myself to cover it up. Yeah, like that was somebody's hand. I mean, we talk about that a lot in pottery, like seeing the artist's hand. Yeah, it's like I very mean, similar. It's this like gesture that they weren't thinking about anything except making it look, making it, enough glue to get it on the wall to get the thing on. unless maybe he or she where it was maybe they were thinking like oh I'm making a little swirly flower thing and they thought no one else would ever see it or I don't know it's related to that idea of like you know, well I'm talking about gender that's part of it for me as well um you know, when I was working in construction, I was one of the only women that I knew working in construction and uh, you have to work twice as hard. You don't get much respect, like all of those things. It was always this like boys club that I wanted to be a part of. So there's something in this building, these buildings too, there's also this like sense of like longing or uh, making it mine or in some way, finally being able to be more a part of that process, something there. Yeah. Well, then traditionally it was, all men. I mean, now I think we understand gender as something more fluid. And I think now there are more women in trades, but still back then and even now, it's, it's definitely. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely not equal. Um, so here's another, I assume, Philadelphia. Um, so I used to drive past this every day and it's actually pictured. The awning that's on it is the awning from five or six years ago, I'd have to go back and look at my notes. And I chose that one uh, because of the flag on it. The flag believe, on it. Which oh, I, the flag, yeah. I believe what it's kind of flag Rico, but I don't wanna be wrong now. Yeah, I don't know. I had Googled it previously, but the awning of that building was fascinating because it started as this one with this flag and then over time it changed. Uh, the flag went away, the name got changed, you know, whoever owned it 10 years ago, were they part of maybe like a large flux of immigrants to that neighborhood and then that moved on? Mm -hmm. Did they not own that business because it went under and that was hard for their family or did the business go well and they moved on to another business? You know, like every corner stores, I'm especially mom and pop ones, especially fascinated by because they talk about like a family. I grew up across the street from a corner store um, owned by Pat and I actually did my whole thesis on that store so I'm partial to them. Yeah that's great. They are there's so much about the neighborhood and um, about the family that owns it but about the people who come in every day and um, well and I I've done talks before and talked about Pat's corner store and afterwards people come up to me and tell me about their corner store like these are like very universal things whether it's a corner store sushi spot like some type of restaurant like we all have these kind of like in, informal relationships with people yeah and the fact that you can walk in and if you go all the time they say hello and know your name and it, it's really uh it's part of humanity mm -hmm. um so then you also this one the first one we saw you 
was on a table and this one's built onto a chair. And I just also want to make sure everyone can see in the awning, I think was embroidered cross stitch. And then this one's embroidered. So yeah, this one's found embroidery. Sometimes I do the embroidery and sometimes I use found embroidery. Um, when I want it to be quite specific, I'll make up a pattern and do it myself. But this one is found embroidery. Um, and there's something about, you know, I'll go into thrift stores and find these for a couple bucks, um, tossed to the side, probably going to get thrown out. And I buy them and I take them home and I kind of repurpose them. And I think again about like honoring the labor that this probably woman put into this textile and um, putting it, elevating it to an art gallery and putting it where I think it should be seen. I think often like um, crafts that are viewed as historically feminine are maybe relegated to hobby uh, more so than fine art. Like I think you're more likely to see an exhibition of wooden tables than an exhibition of quilts. And again, I think we're getting better, but um, so yeah, I almost feel like it's like a special power I have as an artist to decide what can and can't go into a gallery, what should and shouldn't be there. And to yeah. me, it's like beautiful needlework should be. Yeah, wow, that's a, a good, I love the idea that the artist is empowered to, to make that choice. You know, you say it's art and so that's, it has to be accepted on that level, which is important. I mean, sometimes it really is about self-determination. Um, and these are two different. So, and these are more, you know, different kinds of structures, a little bit, I mean, less, not so dilapidated, but um, definitely still having that aspect of, you know, the, the people who live there and, and all the, the little bits that they've added. And... Yeah, these are both um, from Canada. So maybe that's why they're a bit younger. One is from my hometown, Edmonton, Alberta. And the other one's from Calgary, Alberta, where I went to school. And they're both buildings that were made probably in the 80s or 90s. Um, like this show um, is called OK Google, Take Me Home. And often when I say that my phone, yeah, my phone just turned on. God, I don't know. <laughs> because you have uh, because it was a show about moving a lot and what is home and where is home. Uh, and that every time I move, I'll say, I'll enter my home address into my phone and then I'll just tell my phone to take me home. And how presumptuous is my phone to call it home when it's not a home, it's a house, blah, blah, blah. Getting real artsy. <laughs> um, but those ones are kind of a lot about growing up in Alberta and uh, economics at that time. Yeah, okay. Um, and then this is the one that was, that was at place. the Clay Studio for the Clay Studio National a few years ago when you were um, living in Philly and other Philadelphia. So you you moved to Philadelphia and you, you know, you moved to Brewery Town, I think, right? And um, you just seem to immediately get um, excited about all the buildings that were like this around you and had all these layers of information. I mean, I, to be honest, at first I was like really upset by Philadelphia and uh, really sad for the first few weeks I lived there. It's a visually, it's a really aggressive city um, in terms of the dilapidation, the garbage, the pothole, like it just made me kind of, it just made me sad. Like how did a city this large, this grand, this wealthy, how does it have areas like this that are so impoverished? Um, and when I lived in Brewery Town, I suspect the gentrification has swept right through it. Cause when I was there, it was like six blocks down coming at me. Um, I had, and a lot of it too, I mean, the buildings, Growing up, we watched TV and a lot of it's American TV and we're always told TV's not real. And then I moved to Philadelphia and in Philadelphia, TV was real. And all these buildings that I saw on TV were real buildings and people really did throw out piles of tires and lots. And it was just, it felt like, yeah, TV was real, but it was like, it's just a, not a good narrative. So I was like really struggling with how to love this city when it seemed like it was struggling so much. And it was in these buildings and in this like Philly kind of DIY, like get her done spirit that I like started to get excited and saw this like perseverance. And these buildings are, 
beautiful and they've got this like ornate molding at the top they've got like stunning um what are the stairs made out of um the king of prussia marble or yeah. pennsylvania blue limestone yeah, so you can see in all these buildings, all these details of like craftsmen that were there and all this time and the idea of Philly being these row houses as this way to kind of like democratize people owning homes and and then you can see the spirit that was there and coming back. So once I kind of saw that spark, I was like all in Philly deep, deeply love it, miss it all the time. And it's like continued to inspire my work till now. Well, that's I, I loved being, you know, knowing you when you were going through that process and the, I love Philadelphia and, and yeah, it's partially because it's, it's not perfect. Um, no place is perfect, but Philadelphia has a lot of issues, but the, it, there's also so much great stuff and so such a spirit of, like you're saying, sort of perseverance and grit, sorry, gritty. To deal I love gritty. I love gritty. <laughs> Speaking of, yeah, I remember I've been living in my apartment for like a couple of weeks and somebody um, opened the fire hydrant down the street from my house. And I just about called the city to like report it because I thought that it was like, uh oh, I better report this. <laughs> and then I like saw a kid go running past and was like, oh, no, no, no. Like this was like done on per like this again. I was like, whoa, TV's real. People actually do this to like, cool down in the summer and like I'm not gonna be the like white foreign girl who moved into the neighborhood and like reported it to the city like just you do you enjoy your fire hydrants and then it became this really amazing thing that I saw all over Philly and like kids having fun and people playing and yeah so I made these for Christmas ornaments a year or two ago I think I might make them again I really liked them I love them uh and it's not always actually illegal even to open the fire hydrants. Sometimes they, um, firefighters will go and do it and they, or sometimes people have a special key that they're allowed to. Oh, mm -hmm. cool, yeah. good. Because they know it's hot in the city. Yep. Oh, yeah. Um, speaking of more Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, why do you guys have a broken bell? Like, I don't get it. So I close <laughs> it for repairs. I also, when I lived in Philly, got really obsessed with pylons, which you guys call traffic cones, because they're everywhere. And they're public property that people then steal to then dibs public property that is parking in front of their house for themselves, which to me is just this like hilarious, like, <laughs> what? And like, what is the city's budget on pylons yearly? Because it must be just astronomical. Because everybody's yards, there's like a stack. One day I parked by Tyler campus, I don't know, three or four blocks away. And on my Instagram, I did like a, a pylon count on my like three or four block walk. And it was like 60, like it's crazy. There's so many pylon. And if there's like a pothole that's like eight feet deep, they just like <laughs> toss a pylon into it. And they're like, yeah, and they're like, got it. <laughs> I'm like, no, no, you can't just keep, they, like, they just like fill the hole with pylons and they're like, I just, it's hilarious and like endlessly interesting. So <laughs> I made a lot of pylon things in Philly. So yeah, these are shot glasses. That's great. Oh, Jennifer Baldwin in the chat wrote Sammy's Space Savers. <laughs> I guess that's, some people call them that. I don't know. I never heard that. It's good. I was getting messages from people in Australia saying they call them witches hats there, I think, which I thought was Thank you. <clears throat> um, and then that brought you to your trash candles. Yeah, the last, you know, year, year and a half at this point, it keeps going on. Um, it's been really hard for everybody. Uh, and I found myself, especially around the election with COVID, just being like really angry and wanting to make Black Lives Matter, all of these things going on. And as somebody who consumes politics, it was just a lot. Uh, and I found myself wanting to make really angry art and then thinking that like that wouldn't be healthy for me and that there's already enough kind of anger out there. And I think that human is, or human, humor is a really good uh, medicine, palate cleanser, like- Coping mechanism. We, yeah, like we might as well laugh about it. So I, you know, I've always said that things were dumpster fires in 2020 really felt like a dumpster fire. So I was like, okay, well, let's make some dumpster fire candles. Um, it seemed obvious. A couple people had even like sent me um, 
pictures or like memes or something of like dumpsters on fire and they're like you need to do this and I was like yeah I do <laughs> so they're dumpster fire candles um and trash candles um and inside of them there is the missing 2020 ballots I found them they're in my candles <laughs> as well as um, bottles of hand sanitizer and rolls of toilet paper uh, yeah, and I yeah. thought that like that wouldn't still be funny or valid but I they I could keep making them they still would be but I'd like to change the items inside of them but until we stop fighting about the election and COVID I guess it still makes sense it's relevant but yeah those were a lot of fun and like small um things that I could kind of like share with people I had a lot of fun making those I'm probably going to make more uh around Christmas because I do like them yes Carly's going to be in our ornament exhibition stay tuned Oh, Vanny. Oh, I don't have the one. You, you and Rob Lugo did a, a collaboration, right? I don't think I have a picture of that one. Yeah, when we were, no, I sent you so many pictures and I was like, stop sending her pictures. You're going to break her email. The Make one that Rob and I did was I would throw a cup swap every semester when I was teaching at Tyler and the best cup in the cup swap got a prize. And that time it was a little truck that Rob and I collabed on. So I made a little truck and then Rob um, graffitied it. Yeah. Um, this is, oh, hold on. Oh, sorry. Vanny. Yeah, Vanny, this is an actual van. There's a, I could talk about this van for a long time. It's a van <laughs> that I probably have like 300 photos of that was in a lot by Tyler that I would document every day as it got moved around and broken into and as the lot beside it got cleared out and this like hideous new build went up beside it and just an interesting kind of signifier of gentrification again in that area cat yeah problems uh okay <laughs> yeah i had a lot of fun making these little pieces philly love trolley uh i made this for one of my students there, uh, surprise anniversary gift, I believe. Um, her grandpa designed those trains. Really? Or was cool. part of a team that something, so she had a really good connection to those trains and then the, the O and the V come apart and those are shot glasses. I got really into shot glasses because I found that I can make pottery. <laughs> to, to be like a potter, you just gotta have a hole in something that you can pour some booze into. So boom, I'm a potter all of a sudden which I'm not, and I highly respect potters, but this was my way of being a potter. I just have something functional, yeah. Well, I'm excited because where the new Clay Studio building is, um, between my house and the new Clay Studio is the 15 trolley. So I'm hoping to be able to ride one of these trolleys to work every day. Oh my God, that'd and be so lovely. I never got to go on a trolley. I need to make a list of stuff I need to do when I go back. Speaking of the clay studio building, so I have some of your process shots in here. You can tell people about how you build the structures. God, this thing is big. <laughs> I think this is the biggest one I've made. I didn't think so, but I've since handled some of my older ones and I'm pretty sure this is the biggest one. So they're made in two point perspective, um, three dimensionally. So two point perspective is a way of drawing three dimensional things flat on paper where your vertical lines are all straight up and down, and then your horizontals um, disappear to two vanishing points on the horizon. Does that make sense? I'm terrible mm -hmm. at, yeah. yeah. It's, it's something that I only understand enough to make this work. And if I think too hard about it, I lose it. So I just like keep it we'll flexible. We'll say it's distorted perspective. Distorted perspective. I did, um, Ceramics Monthly last year, two years ago, did like a two page spread on my process of how I make these. So if you wanted to know more, you could definitely look that up. Um, I talk about it much more succinctly there and share some of my secrets. Um, so this one has two perspective points. So technically it should just have the one perspective point and both buildings go down from there, but the second building would have been too short. So I decided to have a perspective point from the tops of both buildings. If that kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and it starts out with a lot of geometry and a lot of math uh, before any of this kind of starts happening. And I wish that I had um, my math notes here. I think they might be in the Ceramics Monthly article as well. Um, figuring out all those different angles and then slab preparation takes a couple days because those are all 
one piece slabs and they're quite large. Uh, I make paper templates of all the shapes I want so that I can figure it all out. Uh, they get textured. I compress the heck out of them. Compression is so important in slab building. Uh, and then they need to be fairly stiff to be able to stand. So once they're all compressed, um, I bevel all the angles. I've got dirty girl bevelers, and then I went in and altered them. Well, my dad altered them uh, with me so that I can get different angles besides like the 60, 30, 45. So how do you, um, I mean, as a person who is not a maker, how do you like super duper compress? Like what, what is going beyond just a slab roller? Uh, yeah, slab roller is not compressing at all, really. A metal rib, actually what I use that's awesome is you can see um, on the bottom side of that left photo, there's a pastry scraper, I believe, that metal with the oh, wood. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I use. Those things are fantastic. I didn't know what they were. Um, I got it from my grandma in her kitchen. Oh, this. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. yeah. Because that, you know, a, a metal rib is quite kind of weak. And if you're working really large scale, you really want to be able to compress. So one of those pastry scrapers, you can really kind of reef on it and push it and get a good compression. <laughs> and every time you compress, it's exponentially stronger. Compress, compress, compress. I rant a lot about compression in, um, uh, I did a ceramics congress video last time around. And there's a whole section where I go off about compression, but I think pastry scrapers are, are great. I, that thing I use nonstop. Cool, that's good to know, good tips. Mm -hmm. And a ton of levels and stuff. Oh, here, ah, this is the part that I like. I think every ceramicist likes it best when it's like still wet at this stage. The cracks haven't started forming yet. You don't have to make decisions about glazes. Like you're just in this beautiful purgatory. It's such a great color too, that you just can't mm -hmm. see. Yeah, so I talk a little bit about um, all the little bricks and the, you know, are you looking at the photo and counting how many bricks are in the arches over the windows and stuff like that? I do, but it doesn't always work out. I try as close as I can, but there's kind of like a limit in how small you can make things in clay before it just starts to look really sloppy. Like I've tried to make much smaller buildings because this these buildings take me a very long time. So smaller things I thought would work faster, but they just start to look sloppy. So there's like a point at which you have to kind of make decisions. But I do count all the bricks and try to make it about right. Um, the bricks are all one by one done by hand because they have to be at that same perspective. Like a lot of people are like, why don't you get a stamp? Which I wish I could, but in the perspective, that's just not possible. So I've got a million different metal rulers and all different shapes and sizes that I'll use to make all of those. Yeah. Um, cutting out the windows is probably the most um, dicey time because a lot of those little pieces of clay will want to crack off. Um, so with those windows, I use a drill bit and remove as much material as I can before I actually cut. Because when you're cutting in clay, you're not removing the material, you're just pushing it apart. So that mm -hmm. pushing is, is likely to kind of push somewhere else and break off one of those little supports. So I've got a bunch of drill bits and I'll sit there and I'll drill out as many as I can. And then I'll just kind of try to like shave off those edges. And something I've started doing in the last few years is taking wax then and pointing or painting all those little areas in wax just to protect them as they dry. So they don't kind of like dry immediately shrink and fall off. So you can see that uh, there's like kind of like white goop on some of them and that oh, would be the yeah. wax. And so you can see that this is, um, it's put together before you start cutting the windows out. So you're not just like taking a slab and cutting it out on the table, which would be easier, but I guess then you couldn't attach it correctly. Well, it needs, everything needs to be up so that it can be kind of like, because every, it's all in perspective and it's yeah. built on this 10 degree wedge. You can see it's up on this little wedge. I do that because I wanna mimic the feeling that you get when you stand in front of a tall building and kind of look up and it feels like it comes towards you. So everything's built on this 10 degree wedge. And then to get my two vanishing points, I actually have, you can't see in these pictures, um, strings that are screwed into the wall at my two vanishing points. And I pull those strings and that's how I get all of my um, horizontal lines. Oh. So everything kind of needs to be like up 
set up, screwed to the table in this right place. And then I can start making all those adjustments. Got it. You know, and I look at these and I'm so fascinated by all the tininess. I just wasn't even thinking about the fact that you were cutting out the windows after it was all together, just kind of dealing with it. Do you kind of, do you have a paper template of the window placement, like the photograph, or do you just draw it on, like scratch oh. it on the surface? Uh, I mean, you can kind of see on the bottom left corner, you can't really, that like plasticky looking thing. I've got a ton of photos and then a ton of printed out ones and on them are all the measurements. Like one of the first things I do is take the photos and scale them all. Mm -hmm. So I use measurements from the photo that I then kind of graph onto the piece and like figure it all out that way. Mm. Like everything is exactly as it should be. Oh, that's amazing. Um, okay, so here are some images of it finished. I have to get some slightly better photos, but this is me uh, holding up a piece of paper behind it. In the I wish they could see you. So Jennifer sent me the photos this morning and in all of them, you can see her little face above the roll of paper, like looking <laughs> over. You should have used those. They're so funny. I'm going to put those on my website for sure. <laughs> oh, great. Um, and if everyone can see, there's a an image on the wall. So Carly, you've been, she, and she asked me these questions like, well, you know, I, I know there are some founders. Should I put some of their art in the gallery? So there's a Ken Babrick platter as a, a decal, right? Yep. And then the, um, the cup wall you can see in this window right here. So in the yeah, shop. I've never done an interior space before. Mm -hmm. um, one, cause I knew it would be a nightmare. And then two, because I really wanted the inside space to be the kind of space that people could imagine their own narratives inside of. So that was like an exciting and scary part of this piece was like, okay, let's like make these interiors and how do I go about doing that? Well, I actually enjoyed that part of it. And then there's fabric curtains in this, um, in these windows, yeah. which I love. Okay, so um, I think there's a question in the chat and I'm gonna read a couple of the, the chat comments and then if anyone has questions, um, we can ask Carly and then go back to some conversation. So Diana said, buildings are about community and civilization. Civilization, I can talk. They're tremendously vital. So I love that this is your focus. I love the elevating of ordinary little houses into iconic pieces, really nice and refreshing since usually only expensive houses are given this attention. That is mm -hmm. very true. Um, Raymond, says i've always liked philly's grit especially along the river and the railroad tracks also it's horrible what they're doing to britney thank you Free britney! <laughs> um jennifer baldwin i love oh she likes that it's the 23 trolley line because it doesn't exist anymore uh and she also says i'm not sure what i'm trying to say here but there's something so interesting about how these philly townhouse sculptures take the unique individual properties out of the row out of the block Paired with the perspective, it makes them monumental. Yeah. You know, and I think about my work as being like monuments or trophies to the everyday people that built them and then the everyday people that kind of um, existed within them and left part of their life there. So I think that's really cool that you kind of saw that in it. I, I think that's part, you know, that's part of what, why we started talking and, and had a lot of, um, Simpatico, is there an English word for that? Um, because part of why I've always been interested in historical decorative arts is that same thing. It's like somebody, a craftsperson made this object and there's so much interest in that part of it. And then a person used it and it maybe got passed down. And so it has all the information about both of those. And again, in the decorative arts, you know, in that field before I kind of entered the contemporary craft and then clay world, it was 18th century furniture and who owned it and which families owned it and which house was it in. And they, there wasn't that, you know, people talk about the makers a little bit, but they never talk about them in terms of them being like working class people who were just, you know, talented, skilled trades people making stuff and what their lives were like. And I think that's finally changing, but for a long time, you know, in all art, it's it's about the patrons and it's not about the the people. The people. Well, I remember when I was doing um, gas line work, 
there was one pipe fighter, one uh, pipe fitter, excuse me, that like, he piped things in like a work of art, like perfectly square and around these little joints. And he like took such joy in it. You know, I've carpenters, I've got cabinet maker friends and like arguably they're artists. So I'm um, thinking a lot about kind of like who those people are, these skills, the pride they took in it, I think is really important. And yeah, I don't want to see another mansion. I don't care. I think especially now when we're kind of coming to terms with the grossness of wealth hoarding and those types of issues like i'm interested in like the people that actually made it work yeah yeah absolutely um it's it isn't you know i love art but it's not the object it's i mean it's the object and i do allow myself to love the objects and have like a visceral wonderful reaction to it but it's the the artwork that has all of this underpinning about the the life of the person who made it the life of the person who used it like that's what's exciting that's what gets you beyond like oh my gosh that's so beautiful i want to look at it like you have to have to have that underpinning in order to make it like truly important to our society i think yeah I, I, something that just looks pretty i think is um just loses your attention quickly yeah i mean like there's not much there for you to like go back to Yes, beauty is is valuable, but with when it's paired with other things, it's even it's so powerful. Um, well, I guess that can be where we've come to, which is that your art is important for humanity. I think that that's where we've just gotten to. I don't. That's I don't know. That's a big one. That's. I mean, whoa! I struggled for a long time thinking that being an artist was it a good use of my brain that I should have solved cancer or been or done something more for society uh, but definitely in the last 10 years I'm getting better about um, seeing the value in it and being able to kind of stand upon that a lot of that is teaching um, yeah I don't yeah I'm not there yet We'll see. Well, you're teaching people through your art too. The people who look at your art are learning about your ways of looking at the world and about, you know, the people who lived in the houses and made the houses. So I think it's all teaching really. And it's- Well, and I think too, uh, you know, like my family, the people I grew up with are definitely not into art necessarily but the thing like especially with my dad that I was able to kind of grab with him is that my stuff is well made and that's important to me and that's something that a lot of the trades people that I'm friends with see and see value in so in a way that's almost like my bridge back to where I came from and those people that I'm making work about because now that I'm an academic I worry if I've lost my street cred in that world or, or what that kind of looks like but I definitely think that there's these ways you can sneak in. So with stuff being well-made, I also think I use cuteness a lot. Little things are cute. You want to get towards them and then hopefully you're kind of right at them. And then you see like, Oh, there's something going on. There's other concepts here. And I've kind of reeled them in with that. Well, and just as you're validating your work to your home community with craftspeople, you're also drawing people in an art gallery into something and they see like you said they get closer and I think that what you're also doing is showing the value of that skilled labor to those people who might not think about it who might value a piece of art more than like a really well-made wall but when they're looking at your artwork that is a really well-made wall how can they not help to look at those things in their own surroundings when they go back into the world so you're kind of um that's true. bringing the world together in that way. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, also, cuteness, I believe, along with beauty, is a biological imperative. And I don't think anyone should ever, you know, apologize. I appreciate that you own the cuteness. Humans are attracted to things that are cute because we're supposed to protect yeah. them. And I often like to walk right along the line of like cute kitsch, like you went too far. Uh, you know, things like uh, like beading and embroidery and adding all these other little dimensions. I, I like to kind of live right on the line of she went too far. Well, and also your cute things are lately at least kind of dirty and disgusting. So you're really, you're, you're, you're not um, 
confusing cute that too yeah you, yeah. you've got those uh di that dynamic combination mm -hmm. anyway does anyone have any other questions be happy to um if you want to take yourself off mute or put something else in the chat i've had a really lovely time talking to you carly as usual that's true we did this yesterday arguably Although yesterday you guys missed Jennifer and I trying out all the different um, Zoom filters and, and putting hats and stuff on ourselves. It was really professional. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you for sharing that with everyone. No. It's good to be. And the, this, the beauty of the lunch and learn is that it's uh, casual and we don't it's worry. Cash. About... Yeah, it's cash. Yeah, we don't, we can't, we couldn't do this. That's why it's fun to do it every week. Okay. All right, well, it looks like everyone is happy and no more questions. If you do have more questions, I'm sure Carly would be happy to answer them. Please come to the Clay Studio and see her amazing sculpture in person. It's so wonderful. You really have to spend a long time standing in front of it. So good luck in, in receiving your furniture. I hope you have a lovely afternoon. No, I'm carrying it up three flights of stairs. There's nothing lovely about this afternoon. They're not carrying it up the stairs for you? No, you know how much that costs? I'm an artist. I don't have mover money. Come on. I'm paying oh, no. If you were in Philly, we would all come and show up and help you carry it up the stairs. That's the final part of the lunch and learn. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay, now we have to move the part. <laughs> all right, everybody. Have a lovely day. Thanks so much for coming, guys. So nice to see so many familiar faces. Okay. Thanks, Carly.